the Buddha says that to comprehend suffering, or dukkha. Let's start over again. The Buddha says that to get beyond suffering, we have to comprehend it. That's the duty with regard to the First Noble Truth. And comprehending it basically comes down to understanding why we look for happiness in all the wrong places, in all the wrong ways. The Buddha could have simply said that. One pleasure, but we're not finding it the right way. But that wouldn't be all that helpful. He parses it out for us in two ways. First, he talks about the five aggregates. Now we cling to them, and then he talks about the four kinds of clinging. And you look at the various ways people look for happiness in the world, and they can be analyzed in those terms, if you really want to understand them, and especially if you want to understand how you are looking for happiness in the wrong ways. Now both the aggregates and the forms of clinging relate to feeding, because that's what basically defines us. As the Buddha said, once you become a being, you have to feed. That's something we all have in common. We're all looking for pleasure, the pleasure that comes from feeding. But we tend to focus on different aspects of it. It's not just the pleasant feeling of fullness that comes when the food is down in your stomach. There are other aspects of what we find enjoyable about feeding as well. One is we get to use our body. If we didn't have food, the body wouldn't work. And then we like to get good at understanding, perceiving what kind of hungers we have. That's what perception is all about, understanding. Are you hungry for something salty or something sweet? Are you hungry for a relationship? Are you hungry for power? And then the various ways we go about satisfying that hunger. How do we look for the food we want, and once we get it, how do we prepare it? That's what a lot of the different forms of clinging come under, is this fourth aggregate. Fabrication. And then there's consciousness, awareness of all these things. We enjoy knowing this process. We can't conceive of not being aware of this. If you weren't aware, then you wouldn't be able to follow any of these other ones. So that's those are the aggregates as they relate to feeding. And the different forms of clinging also also relate to feeding. There's Sensual clinging, clinging to habits and practices, clinging to views, and clinging to doctrines of the self. And in an embryo form, we find all these things in the way we like to feed. Sensual clinging is basically like in the fantasize about food. They said, say the people in prisoner camps and the people in the concentration camps. When they first got there, the men were separated from the women. The men talked about sex for a couple of days, then they stopped. Everybody was too hungry. Well, then, from that point on, all they could talk about was food, the different recipes that their mothers used to make and their wives used to make. And we get this real charge out of fantasizing about different things we can eat. Even though a lot, a lot of energy goes into that, and many times a lot of disappointed hopes, still we keep at that process of fantasizing about how this would be good or that would be good. That's clinging to sensuality. Clinging to habits and practices is clinging to particular ideas about how food should be fixed and how you should go about getting it. When I was in France, one of the people there had fixed a ratatouille one time. She put olives in her ratatouille. A while later, I mentioned that to another group of people in France, and you could see the shudder go through the room. You, nobody puts olives in ratatouille. I found out later there were some people who said you couldn't even put tomatoes in ratatouille if you want to do a real one. Tomatoes were a later invention or a later introduction to France. And it's not just the French. Everybody has their attachment to particular ways of fixing food. There's a great panel in Asterix where Women that Asterix has been meeting in his various adventures all come together for a big party, and they sit around talking about food. 
And the woman from Spain talks about how she likes to cook things in olive oil. And the woman from England says, you don't say. I found that if you put you boil things in water, it gives them a really good taste. So we all have our ways of saying this is how food should be fixed. That's clinging to habits and practices. And then there are views about how much we have to stock food up. What are the dangers out there in the world that are going to keep us from eating? What do we have to lay claim to in order to feel that we're really secure in our, in our source of food? And this business of feeding, how long do we have to feed? Is it simply a matter of feeding until we die? Or is there going to be feeding after we die? This is what a lot of the Brahmanical religions are about, or the Vedic religions. The idea being that if you're going to go up to heaven, you have to have food to go there. That's why they had all their sacrifices, thinking that the things you burned in the sacrificial fire would get carried up by the smoke and you'd be waiting for there in heaven. That's clinging both to a view about the world and to a particular habit and practice. And this, of course, is clinging to your idea of who you are. How long do you have to worry about your survival? And what kind of survival is the kind that you really want? The way you look for food is going to determine that. Some people are pretty callous about how they look for food. In other words, they're willing to kill and steal and cheat and do all kinds of other things. Other people say, no, I couldn't live with myself if I did that. So there's your idea of who you are is going to determine how you think about food. And then again, the question, if I have to survive beyond this lifetime, I've got to worry about not only feeding myself now, but also feeding myself after that. So these are the ways we cling to the activities around feeding. And then these types of clinging then to get transferred into other areas as well. And the Buddha parses this all out because he wants to show that it's not simply that we go for a sensual pleasure. That would explain everything. He does say that we are attached to the different aggregates because each of them does offer pleasure. And there's another place where he does say that everything converges in feeling, and particularly our desire for feelings for pleasure. But then you look at people in the world and you look at yourself. There are a lot of things you do that cause suffering, and you find pleasure in them. That's what you've got to understand. That's why the Buddha parses it out in terms of the five aggregates. Which kind of activity are you attached to? Is there a particular perception you like? And John Mahabharata talks about his contemplation of the body. The practice he got so he was really good at looking at every person and seeing them just reduced to what was inside. But he didn't really put an end to the, into his lust, the possibility of lust in his mind. He tested it for a while and finally realized it had to do with the perception. There's something about the mind that likes the perception of beauty and then likes to take that perception and apply it to things around you. That was what he was attached to. Not so much the bodies out there, but his perceptions about them. You could say the same thing about your thought constructs around fantasizing about your pleasures. Sometimes the pleasures are not nearly as nice as your fantasies. And you're actually attached to the fantasies more than you are to the pleasures. And the people are attached to particular views that demand a lot of them, but they feel some secure in the fact that they've got the inside dope on how the world works, and they're willing to put up with a lot of suffering in order to get a reward at the end. And the Buddha himself saw this in the austerities that he, that he followed for those six years. He did not himself all kinds of pleasures, but then he realized he was still attached. He wouldn't even let himself think about sensuality, but still there was something inside that was attached. He was attached to that idea that if you do things this way, there will be a reward. And so you look around, you see how people hold on to political views and religious views that have a lot of bad consequences for them, and yet they turn a blind eye to them because they're looking for something else. They're, they see something else in what they're holding on to. I had a teacher in, in school, 
She was born in Brooklyn from a Jewish family, converted to Catholicism, and was a real admirer of Augustine. You know, Augustine teaches predestination, the idea that God creates people for the purpose of sending them to hell. And she was willing to put up with that because she felt secure in the idea that she'd had an experience of God, which she took as a sign that she wasn't going to be one of those people who was destined to hell. So imagine holding a view like that. In order to find comfort in your religious experience, you have to hold to a view that puts the large part of humanity into hell. Yet there are people who hold to this. And then you look at people outside, then of course you have to turn around and look at yourself, okay? In what ways are you holding on to things that are really detrimental? And you can parse things out in terms of the five aggregates. Okay, is it a perception you like, or is it a way of thinking that you like, that you find pleasant? And then how do you en engage in that particular kind of perception or thinking? In your fantasies, in your beliefs that things have to be done a certain way, in your views about the world at large, or in your ideas of who you are. Now you notice, of course, that as we practice, we have to make use of at least three of those kinds of claims. Sensuality, the fascination with fantasizing about sensual pleasures, the Buddha puts aside, so that doesn't have a role in the path. But we do have to hold on to certain ideas of how things are done in terms of the precepts, in terms of meditation, the practice of generosity. We hold on to certain views about how the world works. Then we hold on to ideas about who we are, just at least to the extent that we're the people who are responsible for our happiness, and we're capable of finding it. But these particular views, these particular practices we have, we hold on to them because they actually do give results, and they take us to a place where we don't have to hold on to them anymore. This is why the Buddha gave the image of the raft, or the image of the relay chariots. There's one relay chariot, and you get to hop into that, and you go for a distance, and then there's another relay chariot waiting for you. You hop into that and keep going. The first chariot never makes it to the end. And you're not there to be in the chariots. You're there in the chariots to get someplace else. And as the Buddha pointed out, right view, right practice. These are things that you can hold on to that will take you across. So there's going to be a certain amount of pain and stress involved in the practice. But not like other forms of clinging, these forms of the practice actually deliver you to a place where you don't have to cling anymore. Otherwise, you just keep coming back and back and back and changing your habits a little bit and changing your views a bit and trying and trying and trying to find something that works and creating a lot of suffering for yourself and many times suffering for other people in the process. So that's the choice. The path may be difficult. It may require a lot of effort on our part, but it does take us to a place where the effort can be put aside. And we're not creating suffering for anybody. And the happiness that comes more than compensates. Remember that image the Buddha gave? He said, if you had to make a deal, someone spears you with 300 spears in a day, 100 in the morning, 100 at noon, 100 in the evening, for 100 years. But then you'd be guaranteed awakening at the end. He said it would be a good deal. And when the awakening came, you wouldn't think that you'd gained it with pain. The goal is that good. And we get there by comprehending why it is that we look for happiness in the wrong ways, and why that's causing us suffering. And the Buddha's analysis is there to help us parse things out, so you can locate exactly where you are clinging what you're clinging to and why, and how you can let go. <laughs>